All right, well, thank you, Eileen. And um, now that this is the second session, we've got all the bugs worked out. This could be absolutely perfect. So, um, yeah, so as Eileen mentioned, I'll just provide a quick overview of some of the benefits of cover crops, the environmental benefits, uh, but I'll leave it to the other speakers to really go in depth, uh, especially on the water quality aspects. Um, but I will spend uh, the focus of my time talking about the wildlife benefits. Uh, so real quickly, again, as I mentioned, quick overview here. Uh, first off, and I'll spend just a little bit of time, so the carbon sequestration benefits. Um, so uh, again, using some really big numbers, making some big generalizations, we can say that cover crops, by having more crops growing on the ground, getting more photosynthesis, putting more carbon into the soil, uh, sequester more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and they can, on average, take about a half a ton of carbon dioxide per acre per year and put that into the ground as soil carbon. Uh, so when you're talking about a half a ton, uh, metric ton per acre per year, that may you know, that kind of gets lost in the translation, in the scope of things. Um, to put that into perspective, if we start talking about getting 50%, 60% adoption of cover crops on row crop acres, we're talking about 7, 8, 9% of all emissions uh, by the, within the United States of, of carbon emissions. So that's a fairly considerable level in terms of offsetting our carbon emissions and having an impact on the climate change that's leading to all of this fun weather that we're having. Certainly is exciting times. Uh, so in terms of water quality, two issues in particular, so turbidity and the nutrients issue, and again, like I mentioned, uh, the other speakers will really go in depth on this, but generally speaking, the soil erosion, uh, when we're talking about agriculture and cover crops, um, and turbidity, it's all those soil particles that end up in the water and it makes that nice brown color, off brown color that you see. Maybe it's more red in high clay areas um, in the water. So those little particles will add up and they will shade out the, these waterways. And when you have shading, then the plants can't grow. And when you don't have plants in the water, they will then, uh, they cannot turn that carbon dioxide in the water into oxygen. And so you have oxygen depletion in those waterways. Also, those little tiny particles, those soil particles suspended in the, in the soil or in the water, will also uh, absorb the heat from the sun. And so they will increase the water temperature. And when you have a higher water temperature, you have a lower capacity of the water to hold oxygen. And so again, we've got some depletion going on there. Then we have all of the other uh, direct impacts that we're talking about here of um, the sedimentation on the, on the bottom, the siltation uh, uh, in the nesting areas and other habitat areas. So then we can go into the nutrient issue. And again, when it comes to nutrients specifically related to the sediment, we're talking about phosphorus. And Jim is uh, going to provide a great overview of how this really works. Uh, but the short of it is, is that when you've got that phosphorus going in with the sediment, then you encourage these algae blooms, and we all know the story from there and what that looks like. And so again, Jim has some great photos and images of what that can mean. So in terms of cover crops then, it having an impact on these two particular issues, uh, a number of, and again, taking the broad array of scientific data and, and research results that we have out there, uh, we can really narrow this down that their uh, cover crops can reduce soil erosion anywhere between 30 percent, maybe up to 85 or 90 percent. And again, there's variation there. So a rough estimate, if we reduce erosion by 50 percent, that's a significant impact in terms of benefiting the water quality uh, and improving the habitat quality within that water. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, now talking about the nitrogen concentration in the water. Now nitrogen, as most folks here know, flows with the water, doesn't really have, doesn't get tied in with the soil, but it still flows with the water. And so anytime we can hold on to that nitrogen on the, uh, in the farm fields, that's gonna be a benefit to the farmers, it's gonna be a benefit to the water quality. And again, the nitrogen contributes to those algae blooms. Uh, and so again, borrowing some data from Tom's work, 
Um, we're looking at somewhere in the 50-some percentile reduction in nitrogen concentration in that water coming off of the farm fields. And again, that is a significant benefit for the water quality and the, the habitat quality of those waters. All right, so we've been kind of working from most abstract getting to more concrete. And so now we're getting to the most concrete aspects, the most direct benefits that we can find, the direct relationships between cover crops and wildlife. And that's on the terrestrial side um, involving mammals and other species, a lot of bird species that use these fields directly in some form or fashion. Either it's to forage on the material that's out there, to forage on the insects that are out there. Maybe it's to nest in there or to find some protection from predators. And so in any one of those four areas, we are seeing some benefits to, uh, to having cover crops out there. So like I mentioned, um, the cover crops themselves can be a forage for wildlife. Uh, and so just a quick description here. So this is actually, I took this photo off of my back deck. This is a little field that I have right behind my place next to some neighbors there. Uh, this is late spring. So in Wisconsin, that is roughly um, Memorial Day, I believe, right? <laughs> no, it's about, uh, about mid-March or so. Uh, we've, I have got a... Uh, Cereal rye planted out there. The deer found that cereal rye. That cereal rye, as most farmers who plant cereal, cereal rye know, that's the first stuff to green up in the springtime. That stuff actually greened up underneath the snow, and as that snow was melting away, those deer found that. Uh, I didn't even take a count. There's probably, what, 20-some 20 20 deer in this photo. Couldn't even get them all in the photo. So if I could get a little further back, there's a roughly about 45 deer in this little 10-acre field. Um, and so they were taking advantage of those cover crops. And at this particular juncture in their life cycle, talking about late, late winter, a hard winter, they're starving, they're hungry, and this is going to make a huge difference to get them through to the point of survival to when everything else greens up. So for this deer population, so probably if I should talk to my local DNR, we probably saw a little spike in deer population in Taylor County, Wisconsin, just with a little bit of cover crop acreage there. So again, to, to pardon the pun, but to drill down a little bit on this, uh, we see a benefit in terms of wildlife uh, when it comes to the food source, and this time we're talking about the soil microorganisms, the invertebrate that uh, are getting populated because of cover crops. And as we've heard from other speakers, the more cover crops, the more living roots that you have around the year, the more of these microorganisms you're going to have. And so that has a significant and direct relationship to success of wildlife uh, in these ag-intensive areas. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research yet drawing and pointing out and providing the data to provide a quick illustration of the connection between cover crops and wildlife. But we can lean on results and data from no-till. And here we have a good example. Uh, this is just some quick data from a study comparing no-till and conventional till. And in this study here, the number of hours for quail chicks to forage to meet the nutritional needs, uh, having a high bar is not good, right? We want the small bar. That means it takes fewer hours. If it takes 20 hours for quail chicks to forage for their nutritional needs, that's not going to work. They are not going to succeed, they're not going to survive, and they're going to die out. All right, so again, shifting gears a little bit here. So there's a considerable nesting benefit to having these cover crops. Uh, and again, we need to, because of the lack of data and the lack of research on this issue, luckily the research is starting to develop, but it's not there yet. We can again lean on the result, research results from no-till. And again, we've got a tremendous difference here when it comes to nesting success, species diversity, um, and total populations of these bird species in no-till versus conventional till. And the reason why I've again pulled on the and relied on results from no-till is that in many ways cover crops are just an extension of no-till. It is 
adding more residue, having more living roots, more living biomass on that uh, field surface. So I want to shift gears just um, see if I can make this work. Let's see here. So speaking of wildlife benefit, so again, that same field um, was winter wheat here this past year that I grew in this field, planted some tillage radish, and you don't see the tillage radish coming through yet because it's about three weeks old, and I left the residue real high because I didn't want to have to plant into that. Everybody knows about hair pinning and planters and residue, and it's a big mess, and so I wanted to simplify that. And so this is about late September, early October, and it became a mecca for the migratory waterfowl coming through the area. And so I had these neighbors for about three weeks. And they stayed uh, day and night, and they nested there. They built up their energy. Uh, they fed. You'll see some of them bedding down, some of them standing, walking around, some of them gobbling at the ground, eating the various residue and whatnot. And it made a tremendous difference for this group of migratory waterfowl to make it to their site to be able to get refueled like this. It, it, I was reminded of that, was it a Hitchcock movie, The Birds? I just got a little eerie there for a while. <laughs> no, they were real quiet, real, they're real good neighbors, yeah. <laughs> they only honked when I went out to look at my cover crops and dig, uh, and dig up some radish, so. Uh, so what we have here, I want to talk about a little bit about the opportunity. So again, this is uh, some of those new neighbors or temporary neighbors, and they love that high residue. They could nest down it. You could see some of them just nested down. They felt comfortable in that, and others could, as, as at the right height, they could stand up and take a peek and see that there were no predators coming around. It was just some crazy guy with a shovel. And, uh, and so it really worked out for them. And so I want to talk about these. These are some examples of where cover crops might fit into the rotation. And I apologize for the Midwestern focus. Um, so those of you in the South or in the West, you have different crops and different rotations, but this is, this is what I grew up knowing. This is kind of what I've been working on. So um, the point here is that there's a tremendous opportunity to get some cover crops in there. And all of these different cover crop combinations have some wildlife benefit to them. If it's a foraging value, if it's a nesting value, um, but there is some, some benefit to wildlife. And as I mentioned, there is, we do meet, need more research on these topics. This is um, a, a little bit of a lag. We know that cover crops are relatively new. Um, you know, speaking, they've really just gotten hot in the last five years. And so now the researchers are catching up in terms of understanding what the impacts are of all those cover crops. And so uh, we need some more research on the local level as well as the larger landscape scale of what broad, shed, broad adoption of cover crops would mean for wildlife. Uh, and to get real specific, there is some management questions that we can, should really be looking at in terms of what would the impacts on wildlife be. And the example I give here is the termination timing. There's potential that terminating a cover crop in early April versus mid-May may have an actual very significant impact in terms of nesting success, uh, forage capacity for various wildlife. And so looking at that relationship can really tell us a lot of things and, and would, really would help us in managing our cover crops if we're looking for the, to maximize wildlife benefit. There is, however, also that potential for cover crops to be a trap crop. And so we do want to know what that looks like, how that looks like, and perhaps ways to mitigate that. Um, and more importantly, or looking at the big picture, if it provides more net benefit than net cost or net loss, well, then it still provides a net benefit. And finally, looking at this pollinator issue, uh, most farmers will not let their cover crops go to flowering or to seeding out. And so, uh, so there may be some limited applicability here, but there are a number of cover crops um, in certain rotations that this makes sense where there could be some tremendous pollinator benefit. And so it'd be great to start measuring and collecting data on that question. So uh, National Wildlife Federation, we, we're working with a number of partners um, trying to provide some funding to encourage 
some research to answer some of these questions. And so we don't have, this research is just beginning, so it will be, we'll start getting some data available towards the end of the calendar year to get some preliminary research. But again, looking at these questions that I've mentioned here, what are the, the, the population impacts all the way from the, the local, the, the very uh, microscopic insect, amphibian level, all the way up to the birds, mammals. Um, and so uh, looking at, again, nesting success, foraging capacity. So um, we'll have some really interesting data uh, if you just ask me in about eight or nine months. Just have to go through a growing season here. All right, so if I can conclude this, so we make sure we have some time for the other speakers here. Some key lessons when it comes to understanding the relationship between cover crops and wildlife. Um, one is that encouraging wildlife can provide benefits, agronomic, economic benefits to production. As we've learned if, in Chris Nichols' speech earlier today, anytime you have a major pest issue, your system is out of balance. There, in a normal natural system, nothing really gets that far out of balance. And so when you have wildlife all the way down to the, the low level food chain, you are maintaining a balanced system. And so you are preventing the development of these pests from occurring. And secondly, uh, in general, what we're seeing, and again, this is very general information and some of the research, early research is showing this, but practices that promote soil health promote wildlife habitat and wildlife health. And so the two go hand in hand. It's a tremendous additional benefit. So we, we have the farmers benefiting from soil health, but we're also seeing considerable wildlife benefit as well. Uh, so with that, I do want to uh, leave time, but I, I appreciate um, everybody's attention, and we'll have time for some questions at the end. Thank you.